and we're grateful for all the impact they've had in the life of our church. On this Father's Day, our Heavenly Father asked us to remember what he did for us in a certain way. We could have done it in innumerable, innumerable, different, innumerable different kinds of ways, but instead, he asked us to remember how he gave his life for us when the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So we have some communion cups that we have, your little communion kits. If you did not receive one when you came in and you'd like to participate, would you please raise your hand so that I can, there's one down here. Okay, anybody else in the middle? Other side. If you're watching online while we're taking the initiative to pass these out, um, you can go grab some liquid of your choice, the grape juice or dietary lemon sun drop or something, <laughs> or bread or a cracker. Listen, we believe that it is not the elements themselves that matter. It's what the elements are symbolic of, of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Does anybody else in the room need one? You need some extra time to go get one. While you're doing that, we're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your body. And thank you for your blood that you shed for us. And now as we remember, as you told us to remember, that Passover took on a whole new meaning that night. No longer did it mean something that was thousands of years old. It was about to be something brand new. And now as we celebrate by taking of the body and the blood symbolically, we honor you on this Father's Day as our Heavenly Father and the Son sent to be the Savior of the world. Amen. So first of all, if you appeal to the bottom, we see the little wafers there the bottom, and that is for you to take and to symbolize the body of Christ. Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat all of it. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant which is written in my blood. Pour it out for payment for your sins. Drink all of it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. And thank you now for the Spirit who will speak to us as we listen to your word today. Please bless the one who teaches. Forgive him his sins, for there are many. We come today to see Jesus Christ and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <laughs> so we're in a series called You Asked For It. And so we began the series with our children. And they gave us some great questions. As a matter of fact, it's still fine for you. If you have a question that you'd like to pose, you can tell a staff member if you'd like to. Uh, you may want to choose to use the app, or you could use an envelope that's down between your seats, which are there for you to give if you want to give cash or check or something like that. But if you'd like to have a question that's answered, we promise to answer all the questions, either on Sunday morning or through our Next Step podcast, which comes out every week with a new edition. So we want to make sure to answer the questions that you're asking. But here's one. That's really curious. Uh, a fourth and fifth grade girl, one of our preteen girls, asked this question. Why did God make Jesus a boy and not a girl? Why did God make Jesus a boy and not a girl? Now, here's the spiritual answer to that. Just because it was God's sovereignty and because he said so. <laughs> let's say amen and let's go home. No, but I think there's some really practical reasons that God has led me to share with you today as we think about how to honor God as our Heavenly Father, Jesus' His Son, and our fathers on Father's Day. Here's the first thing I want you to note. In a world that recognizes something called gender dysphoria, this statement indicates that even preteen girls understand there's a difference between boys and girls, and that God made boys and that God made girls. And here's the second thing. A preteen asked this question. Somebody that's 9, 10, 11 years old. Sometimes when we get older, we get too smart for our own good. And we become manipulated with our questions. But the simplicity of this young girl's heart, I want to also answer as God has led me to answer today. You see, ultimately, men, God has made you to be two things. He's made you to be a tender lover to start with. He has made you to be a tender lover. Now, if you don't understand what that means, understand this. How many of you have a wife whose favorite channel is the Hallmark Channel? All right, there's a reason Hallmark Channel is a big deal. This is Hallmark Channel guy. And you might laugh and you might scoff, but there's a reason that they're attracted to the handsome, tender lovers on the Hallmark Channel. Don't make that channel be the only place where she gets that because you're to be that real person for you. 
Here's the second thing for her, rather. Men, God has made you to be a valiant warrior. God's made you to be Braveheart. God's made you to be Gladiator. God's made you say, I'm going to be the one that steps between my wife and the evil that is trying to attack her and my family, and I'm going to defend her to the death if necessary. So why did Jesus, why did God make women, and how is that different? Women, God made you equal in value. That is without, that is without dispute. Scripture proves it in every kind of way. But different in role. You are the life bearer and the nurturing provider of the love of God to the world. Nobody else can carry a baby except a woman. You can do artificial things, and they're doing things like that these days to try to make things happen in our area where all this gender confusion is happening. It's really not that, that, that complicated. God's made men to be tender lovers and valiant warriors. He's made women to be life bearers and the nurturers that bring love to the world. My father taught me ambition. My mother taught me to love. And my father loved me too. And my mother was ambitious as well too. But you know what I mean. And God has given us this answer for a very specific reason. He wants us to understand what he wants us to be. By no means is a woman less valuable than a man. I would even say they're more valuable. Incidentally, hey, guys, what do you think about a God who gave you the beauty of a woman to share your life with? What do you, I'm for that. How about you? Any, any guys out there say amen? Hey, here's a chance to make points on Father's Day, guys. Here's your chance. Everybody say amen. There you go. I got it. So why did God make Jesus as a boy? First, to take the place of leadership as a man that Adam had failed as the man, the first boy, if you will, in the first place. God made Adam first. Now, here's the deal. Why did he do that? Sovereignly, he did that, but but I think there are reasons beyond just because he decided to do so. We're gonna explore some of those here today as we dive into what God wants us to be. But here's back in the very beginning, the first part of the story. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. But you know very quickly that there was also a fall. There was something that happened that made the man and the woman choose to walk away from God's plan. And quite often, men like to blame it on Eve when in actuality, God holds Adam accountable because when Adam and Eve partake of the forbidden fruit, here's what God says when they go hiding. The Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? It doesn't say God called to Eve. Why did you leave Adam astray? He said, Adam, where are you? Let me say that today as well. In our land and our world, which, in which every commercial and sitcoms and rom-coms and various other things demean the value of a man, let me lift you back up today. And before the end of this service, I'm gonna give you a way that you can do that. If you're a woman, if you're a child, and you wanna lift up the man, the father, in your life, I wanna challenge you to do these things. Now, I also wanna speak very candidly as well too. There are fathers here to be, and your father's in waiting. And you want to be a dad and you've not been able to be one yet. Today's a painful day for you, perhaps. Perhaps this is a painful day because your father may not have been as honorable as he should be. But ultimately, we are to honor the position if we don't honor the person. For, for others like me, my, my first father, my biological father, and my first stepfather are, are in heaven now. So this might bring up memories of, man, I wish we had, I wish we could do more of that, I wish we could go fishing, I wish we could go hiking, I wish we could have those conversations and understand this painful day, but today God wants to lift you up in the land of the living as you are a father or you're married to one or you have ones as sons because God wants to do exactly that. So why did Jesus send the man first? He sent the man to be a valiant warrior and a tender lover. For as a man by death came, excuse me, but for as a, by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, meaning Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. This world is full of a bunch of enemies. And men, the, the world is full of enemies on this thing, on the various things that, and the encounters we have at work, in our communities, in our homes, on our teams. And God wants you to step in the gap to be what he made you to be instead of 
go ask your mother or just hand me the remote. No, God's given us the ability to do something great and wonderful. But I want to say before the end of our time together in just a few minutes that ladies and children, this means that you have a responsibility as well to lift up that father so he will be the tender lover and the valiant, brave warrior that God wants him to be. Here's the second reason. To love as the life force as men provide the fertilizing life force in the physical relationship. I didn't know how to put that in a room like this where we also might have teenagers, but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? God has made this initiative life force this part of the man that comes together with the, the life bearer, the tender, loving, nurturer of love and bringing life into the world. And because that initiating force enters in, there is this life that is created. And so it makes sense that God would send his son in that way as a boy rather than as a girl. It doesn't mean he couldn't have done it the other way. Absolutely, he could have done so. And it doesn't mean that you're less valuable if you're a woman. Do you hear me very carefully to say that? Listen, I'm with Zig Ziglar who said, God took one look at Adam. He said, I can do better than that. And he created Eve. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. <laughs> There's this big word that is, I call it the S-bomb. That's S-bomb. When you say it in our culture, everybody goes, Rawr! it's the word submit. And the beginning words of this passage of scripture begin this way. Now submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. God does say for a woman to be submissive to her husband. But here is why God challenges you to do exactly that. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. You know what he's saying here? I want you to be ready to step in front of anything, a moving train, another person, a bill collector, <laughs> a visa gift person who's trying to sell you something on the phone, and step between your wife and that person who's trying to lead her down a path she doesn't really want to go. God's called us to do that. Let me ask you this question. Wives, if you understand that your husband has submit his life to you to the point of death before you even marry him, can you submit to him and respect him? Can you? Anybody say amen? You don't have to raise your hand. That, that's your call, guys. Our call is to step between evil and our wives and say, no. Kill me first, but I'm not letting you have her. I'm not letting you have my kids. And God, if you're, if you're like God has made you to be, he is stirring something inside of you right now. You're going braveheart. You're growing into the gladiator. You're growing into the warrior that says, I'm ready to battle for my family. But here's the thing I would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, especially ladies and children today, wherever you find yourself on the spectrum, it's hard for him to fight for you if he's always just fighting with you. It's hard for him to fight for you if he's always fighting with you. So how can that be rectified? Let's continue. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing with the word, so that he might present to the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Here's what all this means. That you are lifting her up and not tearing her down. That you are loving her. Hey, let me ask you something, guys. When she came down, walking down the aisle, you didn't go, man, she sure looks ugly today, right? No, you were like, man, <laughs> wow, she looks absolutely beautiful. So literally, we're supposed to, with our words and with our actions, to love and to demonstrate to that one that God has given to us. And then to the children that he blesses us with, that we think that they're more special than any other person in the world, that they're to be loved more than any other person in the world, that they are to be the ones that you are, you're one and only for better or for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, with all that you are and all that you hope to be in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what that means. So the man was made to be the loving initiator in a relationship, and I think that's why God made boys first. Second, to fight for his bride and family as the warrior. There's a time in Jesus' ministry early on where they're 
partying and hanging out with sinners. They're, they're reaching people that no one else is reaching because they're doing things that no one else is doing like we're doing as a church. Sometimes the, church, the, the world out there goes, why are you doing that? And why are you hanging out there? It's because Jesus came to save people that were a mess, not just people that were good enough. As a matter of fact, if you think you're good enough, you're not good enough. <laughs> you never can be good enough. He's come to be good enough for us. And so Jesus is having these parties with these guys and these sinners, and they're inviting people in. They're kind of like in the community, not well thought of. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests, guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. He's like, listen, man, I'm here. Here's the other thing that's hard for men to understand. We are part of the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. One of the favorite pictures of God in scripture, the bridegroom Jesus has come to save the bride. I understand, guys, it's me too. It's hard to imagine yourself to be part of being the bride. But ultimately what it means is that we are the receiver and the nurturers of the love of God. We get to receive that as men and as women. Quite often at the end of a wedding ceremony, sometimes, uh, as a matter of fact, I can go around the room right here and point out some of the people that I've officiated your wedding. When they're walking down the aisle and they've kissed the bride and the bride's kissed it back and they've done the little dip thing and I've stepped out of the way so that they don't mess up the picture and all that kind of stuff and they're walking out. I'll say, now listen, you're invited now to a marriage supper. And this is a picture of what's gonna happen in the end of time when the bride of Christ, the church, men, women, boys and girls, children of all ages, from every nation, tribe and tongue are going to gather back together and to celebrate. A wedding is not just about how pretty is she, although she's always pretty. I've never seen an ugly bride, absolutely. Um, that, there's not what, somebody, somebody gonna drop the petals down the aisle. Is the ring bearer gonna drop the ring? Uh, what's it gonna be? No, it's there to show the world the bridegroom has come to unite with the bride to save the bride. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ. Paul writes to a group of people in a little town called Galatia who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God the Father to whom, him, to whom rather, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus came to be that warrior and he did come as a man. And he came to die so that we might live, even as a husband gives up his life for his family on this Father's Day. I've been crucified with Christ, Paul said. It is no longer I who live. And every man, you've got to be able to say this on your own. But Christ, who lives in me, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Men, women, children, have you made that decision to put the one who gave his life up for you ahead of all else? Let's bow our heads and hearts in prayer. We're not ending the service, but we're approaching the end. But right now, I don't want to go any further before we offer you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and Master. Today, if you've not done so, it's time to say, there's something inside of me that knows that I need to give my life up just like Jesus gave his life up for me. If you're a man today and you've never nailed this down, you've never said yes to him, I wanna challenge you to make this that moment. And here's how you do it. Whether you're watching online or you are, are in this place and invite you to follow the instructions of the host online. If you're in this room, I wanna invite you to take a step. To say to him, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying for me. Men, women, boys, and girls. I'm following you now. And at 10.36 a.m. on the 16th of June, on this Father's Day, I want to show the, the creator of the universe that I belong to him. Today, I invite you to pray this prayer if that's the prayer of your heart. Say, dear Jesus, I give you my life. Now, if that is the prayer of your life, heart, I would invite you in the room, if you would just lift up your hand right now, just say, I've decided today to follow Christ. I want to make sure to nail this down today. Is there anybody in the room who would lift up your hand to say, yes, I've decided. Perhaps we're all, God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you. Welcome. We're welcome to God's family here. We're glad that you're here today. Glad that you've taken this step. Is there somebody else watching online? Another in the back of the room. Somebody back in the family room. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. So boys are designed to give up their lives for the girls as necessary. 
So what, Jesus made God to be loving and a warrior. He said, what am I supposed to be today? I'm supposed to be a loving warrior. I'm simplified it from four down to two at the end to save us. So now what, receive Jesus as your personal savior and follow the way of the tender warrior. So what does this mean for men and women? Men, be the loving warrior God made you to be. You say, I'm, tr- I'm trying to figure it out. Good, me too. <laughs> And as we all are doing so, we can pray for one another and be there for one another and be accountable for one another and be men together, encouraging one another. Women and children of the loving warrior, respect him as God has appointed him to be your loving warrior. The one thing a woman can't live without is love. The one thing a man can't live without is respect. And he needs love and she needs respect too. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to to be pastor for 21, 22 years going on, working on climbing and continue to do what God wants me to do until he calls me to the finish line. And that's not yet. But I preached about this before. I'm gonna tell you, if, if you as somebody that has a father you're either married to or a father that gave you life, if you begin to practice the words that we see And what I'm about to give you right now, it's from a psalm, Psalm chapter 45, verses two through four. It will revolutionize your home. He's supposed to sanctify you by telling you how beautiful you are and how wonderful you are and bringing out the best in you. But ladies and children, you're to do the same thing for him. And this is in the context of of, of a king and what you do for a king. Now, here's the deal. Ladies, if you want to be a queen, you got to be married to a king. (laughs) Kings, if you want to really be a good king, you're going to have a good queen as well, too. So I want to invite you to do something today. I want to invite the men that are fathers, if you would stand, or if you want to be fathers one day and you're not yet, just would you please stand? What if, ladies and gentlemen, Children, to fathers, what if you said something like this to these men every day? You're the most handsome of all. Hey, listen, you didn't marry him because he's ugly, did you? Gracious words stream from your lips. If you want gracious words to stream from his lips, point out when the gracious words that stream from his lips stream from his lips so that he knows it means something to you. God himself has blessed you forever. Put on your sword, O oh mighty warrior. <laughs> hey, listen, if you're going to snicker about this, I'm going to tell you that's part of the problem in your family. Put on your sword, O oh mighty warrior. These days, it's not putting on a sword. It's like, get us your cell phone, baby. Make some deals. Bring home the bacon. Fry it up in the pan. I'll make you never forget you're a man. Come on, baby. Put on your sword, O oh mighty warrior. You are so glorious, so majestic. In your majesty, ride out in victory on your Mustang, hop in your Honda or whatever it is. Go do what it is you got to do to bring it home for our family and to protect us and to love us. Ride out in victory, defending truth, humility, and justice. Hey, listen, ladies, children, even if you said nothing else, but this last sentence before they leave out the door in the morning, Go forth to perform all inspiring deeds. You want to put it in plain English? Go get them, baby. You're my number one. Let me ask you something, men. Would that make you feel good? Men say amen. Some of y'all are scared to say amen, aren't you, right? Because you know you love this. Rise up, mighty warriors. You're so glorious, so majestic. Yeah, see, the evil one wants us to snicker at that. God wants us to pay attention to that. I want to invite you to be seated for just a moment. God wants you to be the man he's made you to be. Somebody, before you need to leave, leave today, you need to go. If you came with your one that you promised your life to, to say, you're my mighty warrior. I'm going to tell you, it'll change your life. He'll be going, hey, well, you need me to go to the grocery store? You need me to mow the grass? You need me to call the visa people back and tell them to leave you alone because I'm calling you on the phone? I'm going to tell you. It'll revolutionize your life, but only you get to do it. God said for us to do it. Let's do it.